I think what's changed is potentially the wider neighborhood. I think there's an Egyptian government right now which wants stability in the area and which does not see the survival of Israel as a threat. If I'm the government of Jordan, I'm not worried about Israel. I'm worried about what's coming from the east and the north. If I'm Saudi Arabia and I have Iranian imperialists threatening my borders and taking over Lebanon and eastern Iraq and northern Yemen, maybe I have a security interest in arriving at long-term peaceful arrangements with the people of Israel. In terms of the Palestinian people, would only benefit from a, a long-term stable Middle East, which Palestinian state can thrive, which the Jewish state can thrive. And Palestinians would have a tremendous opportunity to be leaders of the Arab world, partly because of being proximate to Israel. So those are some of my reasons for hope. That's just hope. I don't think on rational grounds the overall situation is positive now, but when has it been for the Jewish people? I work at a university. The level of obsession and hatred towards Israel is phenomenal. Same people who say you can't say anything about anybody, it's triggering, it's demeaning, it's discriminatory, believe that there's unlimited carte blanche to vilify the state of Israel. The argument is given that somehow this is a political position and has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Two points. Yes, it does. There's only one Jewish state. To selectively deny the right of the Jewish people to self-determination is anti-Semitic. Secondly, let's play along. Oh, you're not anti-Semitic. There's merely one state in the world, forget about the fact that they're Jewish, just one state in the world that you feel free to hate and vilify irrationally. I guess that's okay, because that's not a religion. I don't think so. Well, here's what we know. We know that the governments of the United States, Great Britain, and so on, knew about the Holocaust early in the war. It is not true, oh, we had no idea until we <coughs> conquered the uh, concentration camps. We know at the Evian conference that the leaders of the West refused to admit Jews because they were worried that there would be an anti-Semitic backlash. I don't know. I don't think the historical record is clear. There's other people who would have more knowledge about it, about whether the Allies made a deliberate decision not to invest resources, for example, in bombing the railway lines to Auschwitz. Uh, some people argue it was a military decision. It would have been a waste of resources. The fastest way to save the Jews was win the war. Some people argue it was a callous indifference or worse. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I think what's happening in Saudi Arabia on the whole is a very positive development. Uh, Saudi Arabia has often been portrayed as moderates, but its government was subsidizing some of the most radical extremist elements throughout the world. Uh, Saudi Arabia seems to have made a decisive choice. We'll see if this plays out in the years ahead, but they want to modernize. They want to establish more of a more liberalism within their own country. Um, the Saudis have, were allies with other powers in dealing with, so far, with ISIS extremism, which is an extreme form of Sunni um, violence. And the Saudi Arabian government unlike some previous governments, seems to want to deal in a determined way with the Iranian threat. These are all good things. Uh, there's a limit to how far Egypt and Saudi Arabia can go absent a peace deal between Israel and, and the Palestinians. In order to legitimate Saudi recognition of Israel and so on, it's difficult for them to do if there isn't significant progress on Palestinians and the Israelis making a peace deal. 
And some responsibility lies with Israel there. I think Israel should recognize a historical opportunity and be prepared to do its best to try and move along the peace process to assist the Egyptians and the Saudis in arriving at a regional settlement. I, I don't know what game the Russians are playing exactly. They seem to be more afraid of Sunni extremism than Shia extremism because there's Sunnis in Russia itself and not so many Shia. I think it's a very dangerous game for them to be playing. If I'm Russia, why do I want a nuclear Iran? Um, so I don't know exactly what their long-term calculation is. Israel has absolutely no enthusiasm to go to war with Hezbollah. If Israel went to war with Hezbollah, thousands of Israelis would die. In violation of the Security Council resolution, Hezbollah has not been disarmed. Hezbollah has 100,000 rockets, and Hezbollah is rather short on military scruples. Uh, Hezbollah currently dominates the government of Lebanon. It's financed by the government of Iran. Um, Israel, I believe, yeah, you see stories of Saudi Arabia wants to provoke Israel into attacking uh, Lebanon. I rather doubt the Saudis are urging that on, and I certainly can tell you for sure there's no enthusiasm in Israel for having another war with uh, Hezbollah. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the, uh, the current government of, of Canada um, in this context, but the Saudis do have a history of, of funding extremist elements in their own tradition, which they now seem to be moving away from. There's a larger picture of what's going on in the Arab world. Jews have disappeared from the Arab world. Now, the people talk about a one-state solution. Gee, how did that work for the Jews of Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Iraq? Where are they now? They're in Israel. There was an ethnic cleansing of the Jews from the Arab world after the War of Independence. A million Arab Jews now moved to Israel. About half the population of Israel is descended from what are, in effect, Arab Jews. But another thing that gets talked about very little is the massive diminution of the Christian presence in the Middle East. The Christian population of the West Bank and Gaza is far less than it used to be. Christians are disappearing from the oldest Christian communities in the world, in places like Iraq. This is bad for the Christians there. I think it's also bad for Arab states because I think the states benefit from having thriving minorities. It's a good thing that the Jewish people are in a pluralistic state and they have Druze and there's Arabs and there's Christians and so on. It helps make a state more tolerant and richer if there are minorities. But the Christian minorities may be following the path of the Jewish minorities in disappearing from the Arab world. I don't think in the long run that's very good for the Arab world. I think the cause of democracy and tolerance and pluralism is advanced by having different communities in any society. Now, it's puzzling to me that there are several Christian groups who are enthusiasts of anti-Israeli movements who seem to be very uninterested in the disappearance of Christianity from the Arab world. But the constant harassment of the Jewish people has its effects. Constant demeaning of the Jewish people, constant denial of the basic facts of the history is just one more pressure on the continued survival of the Jewish people. In solving issues in the Middle East, there seems to me at least three important perspectives. One is history. You have to recognize that history is complex. Jewish people have a claim to their homeland in Israel. Palestinian people have a claim to their homeland in Israel based on history. That's fair enough. Second dimension is general principles. Palestinian people have a right to self-determination, and the Jewish people have a right to self-determination. The third one is practicality. You've got to deal with realities. Some things are almost impossible to do in the real world, so you've got to work around them. Of those first things, the, the pressure on the Jewish people goes far beyond UNESCO. There is a movement in academia 
to try and argue that somehow the Jews weren't really in Israel all that long, that the Bible is largely fraudulent, that the Bible lacks historicity, the Bible is a bunch of fairy tales, the archaeological evidence is somehow doesn't support the fact, which is the fact, that there has been a Jewish presence in Israel for 3,000 years. This isn't just a problem from UNESCO. There's a problem, believe it or not, in academic history and archaeology of a certain segment trying to deny the facts of history. And there's a political agenda which is to delegitimate Israel. Why do the Jewish people always have to be on defense? What other people are constantly worried about boycott, divestment? About sending their kids to the universities and being told, oh, you can't have academic contacts with an Israeli institution. We have a culture at universities that you should be very careful about saying anything because somebody's feelings might be hurt. Except there's unlimited license to vilify the state of Israel. Again, if this was just Israeli, Israelophobia, why isn't Israelophobia on the list of forbidden hatreds? But it is anti-Semitic. Boycott Israeli universities? Really? Ever been to an Israeli university? I know of no places which are more open to free discussion. I don't hear anybody saying, boycott Iranian universities. Boycott Russian universities. Boycott universities in any of 100 or 150 countries that don't have free expression. Why boycott Israeli universities? Why is the UN even obsessed with Israel altogether? What is, in the great scheme of 8 billion people on this earth, why is the Israeli-Palestinian tension constantly the central focus of concern? Half a million people can die in a civil war in Algeria. It doesn't make the newspapers. Why is that? Somebody once said that anti-Semitism isn't hatred of Jews. It's obsession with the Jews. Well, actually, it's both. But I, I find the obsession just as an integral part of the syndrome. It's not just the hatred. It's the obsession. Academics who know nothing about the Middle East who have no apparent interest in what's going on in any other country, yes, all of a sudden they're signing petitions denouncing Israel or promoting boycotts against Israel. Why Israel out of all the issues in the world? Why is that? At the time of the Balfour Declaration, Palestine is a ruin, basically. The Ottoman Empire was a very poor colonial administrator, didn't have all that much interest, wasn't all that competent. And uh, conditions for the whole population of Palestine were, were miserable. Jewish immigration happened. A lot of people worked very hard and contributed their talents and resources to building up that area. They did have support from the Jewish diaspora, which helped. The Palestinian economy grew, and it attracted people from surrounding states. Uh, after the state of Israel, now the fact of the matter is, not only did the Palestinian population increase in Palestine as a whole before the creation of Israel, the Arab population of Israel has thrived during the existence of the state of Israel. And like I say, 20% of the population of Israel now uh, is Arab. The Bedouin left uh, Israel during the War of Independence. They were invited back in by David Ben-Gurion. There was about 15,000 at the time of the War of Independence. There was about 300,000 Bedouin living in the southern Israel now. Uh, this is hardly a, a state which is dedicated to repressing and destroying its minority. Uh, this is a state which, under its basic law, guarantees dignity to its entire population. Whose Supreme Court that says dignity includes equality, uh, whose Supreme Court has ruled that you can't discriminate against Arabs, but you can have affirmative actions to support the Arab population, who has freedom of religion and freedom of expression, and whose government is working actively to overcome some of the social discrimination in its society. 
uh, I'm not going to say but. People are like, but, but. Yeah, no kidding. Here's the fact. There's no hagiography in the Jewish Bible. Nobody in the Jewish Bible is perfect. Abraham, far from perfect. King David, deeply flawed character. There's not a Moses, anger management issues. <laughs> You want to read the prophets? The prophets are constantly telling the Jewish people, shape up. You have not acted justly. You have not been kind to your foreigners, your widows, and your orphans. Jewish people are people. They make mistakes. Their government are proposed to politicians, and politicians make mistakes. No one should have to constantly say, but, yeah, Israel's made mistakes. There has been some social discrimination in Israel. There has been. The government's made mistakes. Some stupid decisions have been made. There has been social discrimination in some respects. What has this got to do with the right of the Jewish people to have a homeland in the state of Israel? It's not, I run a course in Israel. We have every point of view possible we can hear from. Some of them are very critical. I welcome that. I embrace that. It's not as though you can't criticize. One of the lessons people get when they come on my program in Israel is it is a free and open society. There are people with many opinions and they are free to speak their mind. It is more than problematic to me, however, that the essential right of the Jewish people to exist in their homeland is somehow at issue, and that it has to be constantly accompanied by caveats. Your right to exist as a people is not contingent on being perfect. There is no state on earth whose precondition for existence is that it is composed of angels. <laughs> There's a history of theological anti-Semitism. On the other hand, if Christians were more Christians and would actually study their own Bible, the Jewish people would only benefit. <laughs> the second point is more subtle, but I'm going to be very direct about this. Someone once said, and I believe it to be the case, that Europeans and you can include by extension North Americans, will never forgive the Jews for the Holocaust. Europeans will never forgive Jews for the Holocaust. There's a heavy stain on the conscience of Western civilization. It doesn't feel good to know that you are the civilization in which the Holocaust took place and that every country in the world rejected Jews who are trying to flee from that. So, how do you overcome your bad conscience? The Jews are Nazis. We did terrible things to the Jews, but the Jews get their own country. Hey, they're just as bad as us. That's the psychology. The Jews are not Nazis. Why the Israel allowed tourists? Because the Jews run a democratic state. You can go to an Israeli university, you can be as critical as you want of Israel. The Jewish state does not keep out people who are political critics of Israel. The Jewish people does not expel its own citizens who are critical of Israel, including citizens who deny the right of Israel to even exist. One of the problems in this whole political situation is there are not common rules of engagement. Critics of Israel as a democracy is committed to free speech. It doesn't suppress tour groups who are there to take a one-sided view. It doesn't suppress criticism within its own borders. You want to go to find a place where there's a lot of criticism of Israel? Go to Israel. You'll find plenty. There was a time when it was the right, 
that was most ascendantly anti-Semitic, now it's the left. And the left does not have the rules of engagements about free speech and rationality and free expression right now. My children go to McGill University. The McGill Daily, subsidized by student contributions, has an editorial policy it will not publish Zionist views. I happen to believe in free expression, which makes it difficult for me because, uh, yes, I don't actually want to ban all this hatred of Israel because I believe in free expression. But there are people on the other side who do want to censor and suppress and intimidate those who support the right of Israel to exist. It's a rather one-sided battle. Particular programs. I would say this that it is not politic for Israel to support the Kurdish people. Israel supports the Kurdish people because they recognize themselves. Jewish people know what it's like to be a historic minority in your own homeland and not have political independence. They know what it's like to be the victims of attacks and genocides. It was not an easy move for the government of Israel to support uh, the Kurdish national movement. In the end, people of Israel, the state of Israel could not be true to its own values without supporting the Kurdish people. It's not a very practical thing to do. It's not a single power in the world that supports the Kurdish people right now. But it's the only thing that a Jewish state can do when it's true to its values. Thank you, Brian. Let's give Brian a round of applause.